the fifth president of Botswana. In the October of 2019, President Masifi was reappointed and as for a five-year term after the Botswana Democratic Party won the general elections by garnering the majority in the National Assembly. President Masifi holds a Master's of Science in Social Studies Education and Instructional Systems Design from Florida State University and a graduate degree in Economics and Social and Social Policy from Manchester University, where he was a distinguished achieving scholar. It is my absolute distinct pleasure and honor to be welcoming His Excellency, President Mufiti Masisi, to the podium to deliver his Yale African Leaders Forum Lecture entitled Botswana's Vision for a Knowledge-Based Economy. Professor Peter Fowley in Stanshire, President of Yale University, distinguished members of the faculty, the Director for Africa Initiative, the Yale community, my distinguished uh, fellow Motswana from Moteti <laughs> West, <laughs> Honorable Minister Kwape, and senior government officials from Botswana, ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening. It is a distinct honor for me to have been invited to this occasion to address you on an important subject regarding Botswana's perspective on a knowledge-based economy. This honor does not only extend to myself, but it also extends to Botswana, the people of Botswana. My acceptance of the invitation from the Yale community is a living testament to the special relationship that has been established and continues to flourish between the Republic of Botswana and Yale University. I suppose a living testimony of the Yale Africa Initiative. Yale University and its living commitment to excellence remains a source of inspiration to all of us who hold similar dreams to a path to a sustainable and prosperous future. I have no doubt that the seeds of collaboration that we have already sown will fully blossom for the mutual benefit of our friendship. It is in this regard that I wish to share with you where Botswana is headed as we march towards a knowledge-based economy. Such an ambitious and noble initiative is also an invitation to the Yale community to join us and help us in this journey. At the independence of Botswana in 1966, Botswana was one of the poorest countries in the world. Despite a small population, subsistence agriculture was the main source of livelihood for the people of Botswana, the Botswana. There were some observers who even questioned the state of our mind for taking the bold step of seeking independence. However, with innate determination, our forefathers were not deterred from going ahead with the project. The country depended heavily on foreign aid for both its recurrent and development budget. However, Botswana's economic fortunes changed in the early 1970s, following the discovery of diamonds, which became the mainstay of our economy to this day. Our founding fathers who managed our resources with a high degree of frugality invested heavily in the construction of schools, roads, hospitals, airports, as well as the provision of basic social services, which has taken the form of free and affordable education, amongst others, 
to enhance a better standard of living. Botswana's natural resources have also been in the form of our natural endowments, namely mineral deposits, flora and fauna, the land and the people. The primary focus in regard to these has been the people as the owners, beneficiaries, and the driving force behind the exploitation of such resources. The country graduated to high middle income, but as the economy grew, the population multiplied at a faster pace than economic development. Even though we have invested a lot in human capital, the productive capacity has decreased and we need to retool and to reskill our people in order to make them relevant to the dictates of the global market. In our national vision, we have set ourselves, amongst others, the target of being a high-income country by the year 2036. The vision further enjoins us to strive to become a knowledge-based economy. Distinguished guests, Knowledge and technology are at the heart of economic development for any country. A knowledge economy, as we may all be aware, is largely driven by three main factors, being human capital, relevant and effective policies, and the requisite information and communication technology infrastructure. Essentially, a knowledge economy is realized when most income and economic activity is driven by content and knowledge rather than other physical resources. At best, such content and knowledge should be domestically contrived and patented. As a country, we have prioritized in our current national development plan four policies that will drive economic development towards the attainment of sustainable economic development. These are promotion of export-led growth, ensuring more efficient government spending and financing, building human capital and the provision of appropriate infrastructure. The tourism sector has for a long time accounted for the majority of Botswana's services, though others ex ex exit such so exist such as financial services, administration and other business services, information technology services, and a range of professional services. Many of these require knowledge-based, many of these require knowledge-based specialized skills, and for us as a country, we need to support their development by strengthening the intellectual property framework. Ladies and gentlemen, Getting the educational basics right is a prerequisite for equipping Botswana with the skills to successfully transition to a knowledge-based economy. Educating our people and sustaining productive human capital has always been at the core of our economic development since independence. Some of the more specialized skills that we need to create and manage before the Industrial Revolution OIR technologies, such as coding, genetics, data science and analytics, will in due course need to be central to school and college curricula. This is why this financial year, the government has committed about 24% of the overall national budget to education. This translates to 15 billion 730 million pula or about one billion five hundred and seventy-three U.S. dollars, making it the largest share in our national budget. The proposed budget will cater for the development and sourcing of e-content for schools, training teachers and school managers in basic ICT skills, and the use of technology on teaching and learning. The allocation is geared towards providing appropriate education and training to students so that upon completion of their studies, they could become active players in the transition of the country to a knowledge-based economy.
This will include improving the foundations of learning and the quality of our education and extending the scope of pre-primary education. At the secondary level, there will be a focus on improving outcomes for learners in terms of maths and science, areas where Botswana's performance has been below expectations. Furthermore, the speed of change in technology and production obligates that learning be a lifelong process and that today's learners will need to have the capacity to re-equip themselves with skills perhaps several times during their working lifetimes. Hence the importance of softer skills such as flexibility and initiative. This will be important not just for individuals, but also for the economy as a whole. One of the challenges of the 4IR is that emerging technologies such as automation, artificial intelligence, genetic engineering, and blockchain may displace jobs as production becomes more technology intensive and capital intensive. Distinguished guests, in view of the global trends towards a knowledge economy, we have embarked on an ambitious project to broaden the national digital ecosystem through the National Digital Transformation Strategy, commonly known as Smart Box, to deliver a smart, sustainable society for our country. The strategy aims to transform the public sector to efficiently provide services to citizens and businesses. The smart spot strategy also seeks to increase mobile network and mobile broadband coverage and to provide internet connectivity to government facilities and strategic locations across the country have been identified for connection to ensure the most impact. As reflected in my government's reset agenda, which has prioritized five areas in our development trajectory, digitization has been identified as one of the priority areas that has the immense potential to unlock and enable high productivity among our people, the majority of whom are youth. Trade and knowledge-based services require upgraded connectivity with high quality, dependable, low-cost bandwidth stimulated through the widespread rollout of e-government services and ensuring effective operation of the national ICT backbone and local area networks. To this end, part of the second largest share of our development budget will cater for information and communication technology projects, being the government data network upgrading, national backbone networks, government data center, and local access networks. My government continues to look for strategic development partners who can assist the country to capitalize on the fourth industrial revolution technologies to advance our objective of connecting our people for the betterment of their lives. I want to highlight the fact that Botswana subscribes to an open market economy and government's role is only facilitative in nature. Therefore, I want to assure you that we remain committed to governance that facilitates the private sector as an engine of economic growth, the creator of wealth, and the much needed employment opportunities for our people. This, in a nutshell, is a synopsis of our vision for a transformative process towards a knowledge-based economy. I will, once again, enjoin the Yale community and other million partners to accompany us on the promising journey. I thank you for your attention. Uh, Mr. President, for a really engaging lecture centered around your vision for a knowledge based economy in Botswana. Um, I'd like to begin with a small anecdote. I heard that you earlier had an engagement with Bloomberg, and um, 1965 there was a film, uh, there's a book published by Ian Fleming, now widely read and even adapted for a movie in 1971, James Bond, film by the same name, Diamonds Are Forever. 
Mr. President, rumor has it you were in New York in the possession of the world's third largest, third largest diamond. <laughs> One found earlier this year. 1,175 carats at a mine in Karawi, Botswana. Is this true? And if so, can you officially put the debate to rest? Are diamonds forever? <laughs> You know, um, thanks for the question. <laughs> Let me begin with the facts. Has the diamond been discovered that's uh, the third largest in the world? True. Was it discovered at a Karoe mine, at Karoe mine owned by Lukara, a diamond uh, Canadian company? True. Was it in Botetti West? <laughs> True. Um, is it about 1,175 carats? True. Is it rock? True. Is it a diamond? It's a diamond. <laughs> Were we in possession of it this morning or holding it? Or just? True. <laughs> Do we own it? No. <laughs> it's, it's owned by Lucara. And I'm really proud to introduce uh, um, somebody who's very closely associated with it, one of the world's leading lights in the diamond trade and industry and technology and management, Odette. Welcome. And he's one of the partners with uh, Lucara who are going to be uh, managing that diamond yeah. and uh, doing what they think is best to give it additional value. And what are we waiting for as government? We want them to succeed the most, give them most money out of it, because then we just get some tax. <laughs> <laughs> we get royalty. Yeah. And we urge them to go out and find more, because they're going underground. Well, you have and yes, diamonds are forever. <laughs> okay, well, you have settled the debate then. Uh, so thank you for outlining kind of all the dimensions of this Karoe diamond that was founded. I mean, so we convened in an interesting time of unprecedented uh, disruption in our global community. Um, the pandemic has caused a lot of pain, anguish, death, loss of life, economic struggle across the world. How are the people of Botswana doing it? How are you faring? You know, the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has been uh, devastating. It has had a deleterious effect on our economy, on our livelihoods and, and people. Um, but uh, we are a resilient people. And so we've got to face up to it and confront it. And the best confrontation when you're a third world developing country without the power of the bi biochemical or biomedical response is to use people power and use your intellect to manage it on the base of the advice we get from scientists. And I'm glad this country, um, though around the university, has given us all the best brains to do that. Um, who is here with us today, Professor Masipili Masipili, trained in Harvard. Oh. He's our deputy coordinator in 2019 and an infectious disease specialist. And so they advise us on what to do. And we follow that advice and we regulate on that advice. We communicate on that advice. He's on national TV every week, he's a household name. And he basically dispenses this advice in language that people understand and can relate to. And he practices medicine um, and, and teaches um, uh, young doctors at the university teaching hospital. And so we, we have responded in ways that we can best, but it's affected us. We've had a loss of life, loss of jobs, uh, loss of opportunity, loss of market, uh, and uh, we've seen our, our, our you know, bank balances and government accounts depleted as we buy the necessary PPE and other um, interventions such as vaccines, even though we paid so many vaccines that have not yet arrived. Right. Well, 
thank you for outlining that. And uh, we also would like to note that uh, we do welcome people who've been to the university up north that won't be named. There's not <laughs> about <laughs> you know, much crimson around, but, <laughs> uh, but we appreciate how difficult and challenging this time must be for you and the people of Botswana. And we hope that um, as vaccines become more accessible, uh, that there is some light at the end of the tunnel. Um, many leaders, some leaders who have come to speak at Yale in the past have sometimes uh, pointed to the miracle of Singapore, uh, Lee Kuan Yew's model of transformation and development as being uh, one of the pathways they aspire to taking to transform our continent. Uh, I'm curious about your sentiments on several African countries steering to look eastwards uh, to partners for opportunities for trade and commerce, technology transfer, and so on. Uh, China obviously comes to mind as well. So I'd be curious about your international engagement strategy and uh, your engagement uh, in the East. Well, uh, broadly speaking, we have a very open foreign policy. We are non aligned uh, because it's in our best interest not to be aligned. It's in our best interest not to be dealing with problems that are not going to help us develop. And so, Botswana's foreign policy is premised on protecting and growing Botswana's interests first. We have friends, um, both in the East and the West, uh, from whom we derive uh, a lot of benefits. Um, we exchange views and we share values, but we do have differences, and those differences we manage diplomatically. But those things essential for our development and growth we negotiate for and we take what's best for us at the time. And both have a lot to offer. Uh, so we're in the lucky position of shopping and making you compete. And we pick what we think is the most competitive. We're not always right. Um, and so we learn from those experiences. So we do shop in the West. We've shopped in the West much more than we've shopped in the East. But we also do shop in the East for both ideas and content. Um, and so um, it, it, it suffices to say that uh, we do uh, work very harmoniously uh, with China, very harmoniously with the United States uh, and others. As for the model of development, yes, Singapore has done exceedingly well. Um, but uh, you know, Singapore is not Botswana, and Botswana is not Singapore. For one, the land mass is different, the weather patterns are different. Uh, we in Botswana have a big budget that is dedicated to a wildlife department, something Singapore could never have, right? In Botswana, we, we have to deal with human wildlife conflict. And a lot of the human wildlife conflict these days is to do with elephants. We happen to be the home of the highest number of elephants in the wild in the world. We've looked after them on your behalf, <laughs> right? And when I say your behalf, I mean the world. Yes, it is, it's a resource that we all share. Uh, but uh, you know, we do get into conflict with them, and we've got to manage that conflict uh, without endangering the people without endangering the wildlife. And so it's not exactly um, transferable a model as one would wish. We are a democratic system, an open, you know, liberal democratic system. We've had elections every five years, and it my, it's my fervent hope and determination, at least while I'm in charge, that they, they will have elections every five years, free, open, transparent, and fair elections, and it is the winner who will uh, assume power. So if we go to the elections and I lose, I lose. I go home, and I won't turn back. I won't want to come back. Uh, and so you, you can't exactly impose a model from a city, nation, state on a, 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 a developing state uh, like Botswana. Thank you. Thank you for kind of pointing out the fact that the context is very different and it's important. 
uh, and there are various nuances that are unique uh, to your nation and various needs and dynamics uh, that make it necessary for a policy that's responsive to those needs. Um, I would like to open to a few questions from the audience. I know we started a little bit late, so please uh, raise your hand and press the button. When the light turns green, you'll be able to speak into the microphone. Can you introduce yourself and ask a question? Keep it brief, so we don't have much time. Thank you. Uh, well, with the transition to an energy economy for Botswana, what is the Botswanian government doing to encourage uh, entrepreneurship among Botswanians? Okay, so take one more question. Uh, thank you, Excellency. Uh, James Wandy, I'm a Yale World Fellow over here. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, the role that Botswana is playing as a steward, and indeed many countries on, on the continent are playing as a steward of the, of the world's natural biodiversity and bounty. Coming after the COVID discussions, we'll be heading into COP26 and the discussion around climate. What is your view on what is the, what, how is Botswana thinking about its position around COP26? And what do you think is Africa's overall role in the fight against climate change? Good questions. Thank you very much. What's Botswana government doing to encourage uh, entrepreneurship in Botswana? We're providing a lot of um, uh, education and opportunity. Legislative um, space uh, is created um, so that uh, there are some reservations. We tussle back and forth about the um, prudence of uh, um, reservations and, and the lack of it. So we're very careful in, in, in its use. But when we have infant industries develop and we have a nascent entrepreneurial culture emerge, we attempt to protect that. Um, we provide training, we provide mentorship, uh, we provide uh, procurement um, uh, 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 categories for certain uh, things to be bought uh, from uh, uh, those entrepreneurs. Uh, but it's, it's just never enough. It's never enough because we need such uh, small scale entrepreneurs to grow and get to the next stage until we become fully fledged business persons. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing uh, challenge. Uh, and we do provide training right up to university. Um, it, it's the relevance of that. Uh, um, James Wangi, uh, you asked if uh, it's going to be a steward of our natural, natural resources. Um, what do we think about um, the upcoming environmental conference in November in Edinburgh? Um, Glasgow. Glasgow, sorry, in, in Scotland. Um, you know, we, we are we're very, um, we're, we're signatories to the Paris Accord, uh, for one. Uh, we are very determined to make sure that we play our part in uh, contributing to the management of climate change. We're extremely worried uh, by nation states whose impact is significant with respect to issues of climate change. Uh, delighted that America is back as a party to the Paris Agreement. <laughs> but you need to catch up. You need to make up the last time. You really need to, because uh, you're such a big economy player. Um, we need to harness the uh, green uh, energy space. Uh, and we may be just as guilty because we apparently have some of the best sun opportunity. And we have an integrated resource plan that we've approved. And we're tilting to go green. Um, we say this, and we want this, um, in a situation where we had discovered huge deposits of coal. I mean, 
with more than 200 billion tons. Can you imagine? And so uh, we're tussling and grappling with what we do with all that. Uh, there were others who were wanting to exploit it. Um, but increasingly, as you know, um, the financial institutions will not be willing to fund that beyond 2030. And so if anything started now, it really would make a, a return on investment. So, so we are deeply committed. Uh, we want other countries in Africa, at least those we associate with, in the national, management, national economy management space, to go together with us on that. But it needs huge investment. And a lot of investment is R&D. And so we look to learning, leading uh, research is, you know, institutions, such as Yale, uh, to help us at least with the capacitation to be able to um, help ourselves with all that. Well, uh, I don't envy you having to deal with that decision about uh, the coal deposits, but last I checked, uh, diamonds come from carbon and coal, so uh, <laughs> this could bode well for the future of Botswana yes. in some way. And we'll take a few more questions. Uh, from My name is Desmond, uh, and I have a question regarding transforming the relationship between Botswana and Hawaii English, and how you turn or your approach towards ensuring that this initiative that you are taking uh, is also transferred and moves into these other your counterparts, and that you become an influential point where all the other countries can look around you and begin to copy what you do. Is there initiative to do that, or are you just focusing more on the professionalism and just focus on yourself in this country? Thank you. So, how do you read your dynamics? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, my name is Imran Keita, and I'm from Liberia, a student in your college. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say thank you to the people of Botswana for being uh, the shining city on a hill for prioritizing in democracy in Africa. You know, uh, my question has to do with uh, what is the government doing to promote women empowerment and women involvement in democratic processes? Oh yes, we celebrate uh, Botswana for having uh, sustained decades of democratic rule. Uh, uh, we have Sereza Kama and uh, 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 Catamel Masiri and all four presidents before you, but what is the government doing to ensure that women are inclusive in the government process of Botswana? Thank you. Yes, one more. Uh, Hi, my name is Abby Kolka. I'm from the School of Public Health. Uh, thank you so much for coming to speak to us today. And I wanted to ask, uh, what does collaboration look like within the continent for you and for Botswana under this month? Lens of knowledge-based economy. Sorry, can you ask again? What is? Sorry. Can you say that again, please? Oh, what does cooperation look like on this con on the continent of Africa under this lens of knowledge-based economy? We can take one yeah. more. One more. Yeah, right. let's do it. My name is Udoju Ilo uh, from Nigeria. So I was, I'm really curious to know, uh, just like the last person said, uh, Botswana is one of the shining lights on democracy uh, in the continent. But if you look at current reports, Freedom House, uh, Economic Intelligence, the decline of democracy in the continent is really worrying. Increasingly, a lot of countries in Africa are going from democracy to hybrid democracy and, you know, plain dictatorships. And the African Union has one of its commitments, the protection of democracy in the continent and serious resistance to undemocratic change of power. I just wanted to know the, the Council of the Head of States, what are you guys doing at this point to address this decline? 
And what lessons can we pick from Botswana? What has worked in Botswana that is not working in, in the other parts of Africa? That we're having this you know, terrible, terrible loss to democracy. We have about three, four queues on the continent between last year and this year. So what was your take on this? Thank you. No. Thank you so much. Um, let me begin with the. Let me stop now. With Ibrahim Keita. Yes. Yes. Which is the first one? No. No, no, no. Desmond. Desmond. I thought it was Desmond, right? Yes. Uh, but so are your neighbors. Yes. Um, um, how are we uh, influencing one another? Um, we we are part of uh, a region, uh, both in the economic space through the um, SACU, the oldest customs union in the world, began in 1910. That's between Botswana, Swahili, Lesotho, Namibia, and South Africa. Um, and so we, we cooperate. Um, it's not a, 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 an equitable system, uh, as many unions are not. Uh, and so we, we try very hard to, to make it work better as we, we all go. We're also part of uh, SADC, uh, that's a socio-economic and political organization. Um, and it's got uh, you know, a, a bigger number of uh, member states, uh, wherein we also have a very political and focused um, organ, um, which I just uh, happily uh, chair for a year, and I hand over to President Ramaphosa, the Organ of Politics, Defense, and Security Cooperation. It is that instrument, more than any other within SADC, that is used to influence one another in the political space, you know, uh, between, uh, uh, between countries, in the spirit of promoting political cooperation, promoting defense cooperation, security cooperation, um, and uh, a, a, a battery of values for holding elections, for instance, is generated. A system of monitoring for elections is generated. A system of presidential influencing is there. And I could just let you know, I wish I had my phone here to take it out. Um, I was uh, messaging uh, up in between ourselves and President Lungu as the elections were unfolding. And part of that messaging was to to ask him, hey, you know, let's let's be with it. I mean, it's, it's you know, you 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 look doesn't look like you made it. So please accept the results. Um, it's not easy to say that to another head of state. We often are restricted by the considerations of sovereignty. Um, but we we as as colleagues, uh, you'll find out when you're president. You know, <laughs> talk to one another sometimes very frankly, uh, particularly when you when you develop a friendship, and so we've developed that within SADC, um, and uh, it doesn't always work, right? I must admit it doesn't always work, because you can at least do and say things to a point, and it's only when it gets really bad that you you would raise the alarm. There's also the um, and this is a continental wide one. It, it gets to part of what Udo, I think, is asking. It gets a little more complicated when it gets to the African Union and bigger. Uh, many of the African countries, including those in the South, attained their independence through struggle. Right? They fought for liberation. And when you're a liberation hero, that seems to cling on and uh, seems to blind. Uh, uh, some people are into not seeing or pointing out, not accepting some things that may be going wrong that may be happening. Um, and there's a lot of solidarity uh, that, uh, you know, has been part of the narrative for a very long time. But that's slowly changing with the generations that come on. But, you know, outright, you know, um, uh, condemnation and uh, is often uh, viewed uh, very negatively and not effective. Uh, it's best to engage, um, you know, uh, uh, as as countries uh, relate. So yes, I would accept what you say, Udo. Um, 
you know, democracy, it would seem, is on the decline. Um, and it's very worrying. Um, there are a number of coups that have taken place. There was a time when the AU um, abhorred coups. Um, but uh, we still do, um, but they, they still uh, do happen. Um, so there's a lot more that I think needs to be done in terms of uh, capacitating and training uh, those who would uh, manage the affairs in Africa. There's not enough of it being done. Ibrahim Keita, um, we thank you for you thank us for democracy in Africa. But what are we doing in Botswana to promote women empowerment in in politics? Gosh, I wish the women would answer that. <laughs> we do everything we can to try and encourage them, and I speak on behalf of even the opposition, the political parties in Botswana. We do very badly. Um, Many women have said very openly they find politics in Botswana unattractive, vicious and nasty. Um, and so uh, there's also the, the, the aspect of cost. Um, over time, uh, men have uh, had great opportunity to generate income more than women generally. But what we have done as a government, at the executive level, is promoted a lot of women. Um, probably 50% of my permanent secretaries are women. At least all the permanent secretaries, from the permanent secretaries to the president, the deputy permanent secretaries to the president, and all the permanent secretaries in the presidency, three ministries of the presidency of Botswana, are women. And one of them is here, permanent secretary from the Minister of International Affairs. We can have a conversation about why she doesn't skip over and contest the election. <laughs> and, and, uh, and others. It's my chief of protocol uh, to women, deputy parent secretary level. You want to raise your hand? <laughs> still in women's politics. But uh, we've had some very successful women politicians. There are very few. The ruling party has the most uh, number of women in parliament, and the only women in parliament in the ruling party. The other party is, unfortunately, um, well, I shouldn't say unfortunately. Uh, we don't want them to increase the numbers. So much. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have any in, in, in Parliament. So we, we, we will continue to, you know, uh, encourage uh, our women folk at the political party level. Uh, there are a number of models because we're going to be reviewing our constitution that some people are postulating. Uh, perhaps having a reservation system. Some people don't like it at all. You know, a quota system, something like that at all. But it's not really for me to say. The nation will speak and they will decide what they want to do. Uh, because it's disturbing when you have more than 50% of your population not represented at the leadership level. It's very worrying. Um, it's almost like a single parent headed household and the parents are men. You know, when they go beer drinking, it's a problem. <laughs> Uh, AB Coke, I think it is. What does cooperation look like in a knowledge based economy? Particularly in the region, um, we have a, a training exchanges, intellectual capacity exchanges. You know, um, we have our lawyers, patent lawyers. Uh, we, we could just be uh, offering training in one university in the region and uh, sharing that with others. That is be the basis for the training. So it's really about building the ecology for that. Um, our customs clearance systems, our payment systems and platforms. Would be. So there are a lot of work to be done in terms of providing solutions and new systems of exchange. Um, and, that, and that's where the excitement is because you, know, you can generate so many things that do not occur, that just are not there. And you can develop a new economy. Um, so I look to our young people to really, uh, you know, take us to the moon uh, on this. So, uh, and we will, we will pay pay them to, to help us do that. I think those are the ones that were asked. Yes, yes. So I think that's uh, unfortunately we might have just time for one more question and then we wrap up. So uh, this is a tough one. Wow. <laughs> okay, uh, the gentleman right there. Uh, 
Hello, my, my, oh, my name is Nadim. Uh, thank you very much uh, for coming and, and a, a great lecture. Um, my question is with respect to energy and energy access with particular regard to rural communities in Botswana. Um, as you talk about a knowledge-based economy, uh, increased technology access, uh, e-education, these things seem inherently tied to energy access and reliable energy access. And I'm wondering what your administration is doing and perhaps who you're partnering with uh, to improve energy access in the country uh, to enable the knowledge-based economy that you speak of to take root. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great question. <laughs> great question. A, we're looking for more partners, right? Well, we're looking for partners that are creative and innovative. And do you know why? Because some of the places that do not have energy or access to energy are in far, remote, difficult to reach, lonely populated places. But with this enormity of sunlight, we think the solution would be solar, off-grid. We have our integrated resource plan. And by the way, you know, access to energy and reliable energy is quite high in Botswana now. The rural electrification is pretty high. But the rate at which you know, settlements are growing, sometimes, sometimes outstrips the supply capacity within a particular locality. Um, but with the integrated resource plan, it would allow for those who generate energy, excess energy from a solar plant, to sell it to the grid. And the beautiful thing in Southern Africa is that we have an integrated exchange system for selling energy to other countries. So you can actually trade and sell your energy to Zambia, to Mozambique, and so to wherever there is a, a deficit. Um, and we plan in, in, uh, to be, um, a, be able to export energy within the next three years because we floated tenders to you know, generate um, um, 100 megawatts of energy from solar in addition uh, to what we have. Uh, and uh, we will be. Um, licensing independent power producers as they come and go. Um, a rooftop uh, solar you know, uh, systems coming up. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, any other new partners who come with new solutions, come see us. We're a great country to be in, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> we, we love this place. We, we take good care of you. Um, we let you in and out. We let your money in and out as you want. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, in any currency, you know, uh, exchange control. Um, and if you have excess money, you can just go down the street and, and buy some diamonds and take them home. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I am, I am certain that there will be many in this room and outside this room who will take you up on your invitation to build stronger cooperation and ties between uh, us and uh, the people of Botswana, especially the ambition to develop a knowledge-based economy. You've covered a lot of ground in your lecture and conversation today, uh, gender equity, climate change, renewable energy, um, natural resource management, adding the value in the supply chain for people, education, but also importantly, the your vision for a non-aligned approach to your international engagement to fulfill the priorities and needs of the people of Botswana through cooperation. And so it is in that spirit that we're delighted to have you here on our campus uh, to set the stage and articulate that vision. Um, so I, we are, we're out of time for the lecture portion of, the sec of this session, uh, but um, we would ask you that you please remain seated as uh, we exit and there will be a following reception but before you leave, Mr. President, it is obligatory uh, yeah, that you need to pull on <laughs> initiation or a picture. I'm not sure the gentleman at the back will be too happy with this, but. <laughs>
Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> she likes the album. <laughs> 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 it's raining today. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>